morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all. Thank you so much for joining us for today's um, tax talks. Um, I understand we have over 1,100 participants registered for uh, today's webcast, um, which will also be put online so that it's available for those um, in other time zones who weren't able to join us live. So um, although it's been less than three months now since our last tax talks, there, there's been quite a few new developments and we wanted to um, get back with you to share some of those updates today. Um, joining me for today's presentation are several of my colleagues from across a range of our teams within the Center for Tax Policy and Administration, each of whom will take you through um, different items for today's discussion. Um, so turning to our agenda, the, the, bulk, the bulk of today's webcast will focus on the publication um, of the current text of the Multilateral Convention Implementing Amount A of Pillar 1, as well as the two key developments relating to Pillar 2, um, the opening for signature of the MLI implementing the subject to tax rule, and the publication of the Handbook for Implementation of the Global Minimum Tax, as well as a few other updates on the minimum tax. We also will share um, the latest economic impact assessment um, relating to Pillar 1 uh, and a couple of items on Pillar 2, um, as well as the work that we are doing to support developing countries on implementation of both pillars. Finally, we'll close with a look ahead, including areas of focus um, and some of our forthcoming publications and events. Um, throughout our presentation today, we will try to respond to your questions that we received when you registered, as well as um, any submitted during the webcast. Um, if, if we don't get to your questions, we are planning to have a, a deeper dive webcast. I'll talk about that at the end and hope to uh, make sure that we get to those questions at that point. So with that, let me um, just launch, a, get us started. Um, by providing a general overview of where we are, some of the updates um, that have, or developments that have happened recently. Um, so on the 11th of October, just last Wednesday, the OECD on behalf of the 143 member inclusive framework on BEPS released a package of material, um, including a text of a multilateral convention to implement amount A of pillar one, as well as the handbook on the implementation of the global minimum tax under pillar two. <laughs> The implementation handbook, which was uh, prepared at the invitation of the Indian presidency of the G20 and presented at those meetings just last week, provides a, a high level um, entry point into the design and operation of the global minimum tax rules, as well as a starting point for tax policy and administration officials who are considering various implementation options. The multilateral convention um, is a text of a multilateral treaty that would increase the share of profits that market jurisdictions can tax with respect to activities of large and profitable multinationals operating in their markets. The convention sets out to accomplish really four key objectives. Um, first, it outlines the architecture for this coordinated reallocation of taxing rights to market jurisdictions and also ensures that relief that there's relief from double taxation that would otherwise result from this reallocation. Second, it provides a mechanism for securing tax certainty for in-scope multinationals through uh, dispute prevention and resolution um, mechanisms. Third, it provides for the repeal and curtails the proliferation of digital services taxes and relevant similar measures, thereby preserving stability and certainty in the international tax system. And finally, it incorporates several design features and adaptations intended to address the unique circumstances of developing economies. And we'll take a deeper dive into these elements in a minute. Um, the inclusive framework agreed to publish the text now as a step uh, forward towards signature with remaining disagreement on just a few issues by a small number of countries that are reflected in footnotes. These jurisdictions have been actively and constructively engaging to resolve these issues um, as swiftly as possible. But it is important to note that the publication of an MLC text reflecting a, a really broad consensus on the vast majority of the architecture for Mount A represents another very significant step towards practical implementation of the October 2021 agreement and yet another milestone in the broader BEPS journey. 
So um, again, we'll, we'll cover some more detail in a minute, um, but in addition to the, the developments I just discussed uh, from last week, in the last two months, the Inclusive Framework has uh, adopted and opened for signature um, on, on the 2nd of October, the multilateral instrument to implement the subject to tax rule of pillar two, which is of particular importance for developing countries. Um, and we also um, received and, and published comments from the consultation of the simplification and streamlining of the transfer pricing rules under amount B. Um, finally, just um, a few additional highlights from recent months. There have been two G20 meetings, a leaders summit um, on, in the beginning of September, as well as the fourth finance minister and central bank's governor's meeting um, in Marrakesh just last week, where I've just returned from. Um, at these uh, meetings, uh, the, the ongoing international tax work um, was discussed, uh, acknowledged, and uh, you know continues to be supported strongly. Um, in the context of these meetings, we also published uh, the latest tax report from the OECD Secretary General, um, as well as uh, a number of other reports, including a roadmap for developing countries, several reports on transparency, and of course, uh, the various recent uh, package of impl implementing the two-pillar solution. Um, last week, we held the 16th plenary meeting of the Forum on Tax Administration um, in Singapore, um, which brought together commissioners from advanced and emerging tax administrations from across the globe, along with representatives from international tax, uh, uh, international organizations and regional tax administration bodies um, to discuss the priorities uh, for the forum, including digital transformation of tax administrations and capacity building. Finally, uh, countries are continuing to make progress in tax transparency and exchange of information. Um, and the Global Forum is continuing to work on the second round of peer reviews on transparency um, and exchange of information. There are 101 ratings that have been assigned and 85% of jurisdictions are now rated as compliant or largely compliant with respect to their transparency um, and exchange of information status. The Global Forum is also moving forward to implement the crypto asset reporting framework with a new voluntary group scheduled to meet this month to take this forward. So with, with that, so clearly a lot going on, um, but again, we'll focus today on the most recent developments and to get us started on the MLC, let me hand it over to Occam Pross. Thank you, Manel, and uh, good morning to all of you. Um, I'll walk you through a little bit um, about the MLC, and then you're going to hand over to a person that is a vastly more competent to do this. That's Jesse, who's gotten up very early in the morning to be uh, with us here. Thank you, Jesse. Um, and talk you through a little bit, you know, the overall timeline, the overall workings, the complexity, some of the questions we get, get into some of the footnotes, as Manal has indicated. Um, and then leaving most of it unanswered, handing it over to Jesse to give you the true answers. Now, um, this is a timeline that you can see here, and I'm not going to take you through 2018, 19, 21, 22, and where we are now, as Manel has just said, with the unanimous agreement of all the members of the inclusive framework to release the text that you now have. But I think suffice it at this point to say, at least like stepping back, that is, if you wish, that countries on all of those diverse interests have been at the work on the MLC for a grand total of approximately four years, if you if you look at this. Now, on the one hand, you could be saying that's quite a long period of time, but then also when you step back and just look at this a bit from the outside now, um, it is also a relatively and in some sense remarkably short period of time. If you think about the divergent interests that needed to be addressed from countries and jurisdictions that ideally wouldn't have wanted to do anything to some that would have wanted to do a lot more to many of those that have specific interests. And that's why it's so important to have a consensus process where these voices can be heard. It takes time. It is difficult. It is a process of ongoing discussions, understanding the issues and bringing them together in an area that makes systematic changes in a structural relevant piece of the international taxation framework. Many of the innovative and novel features that we had to bring, and that's also important where we're not just preaching, we're doing what we preach. And so we've also designed something that brings the tax administration together with the design of the rules. So you do all of this together. Um, I think four years in some sense is a, a relatively short period of time. You throw in COVID in the middle. And so I really want to thank also the hardworking delegates that work tirelessly 
on making that possible. So you now have a text and importantly, it's not a text whereas Manel has indicated there's a high level as you can see of agreement on the design here. And it's also translating that agreement into uh, the words of a binding multilateral convention. And so against that backdrop, I think it's at least in my mind, quite a remarkable feat that that was possible within the four year period of time, compare it also to some of the structural reforms you might be encountering in your country. So, so that's one word, I guess, about the time. If we can go to the next slide, um, this is sort of the all in presentation, which I'm going to do in a couple of minutes, just to give you a, a sense here, uh, I think of where we are. Uh, but maybe before I do this, having talked about time, let me also briefly talk about complexity. Yes, we will not be saying that the MLC is not complicated, but before we go on into this, I think also a couple of reflection on complexity, I think that are important to make. First, I think it's important to recall that the design of the multilateral convention, right, is a system of taxing net. It is not gross, and we all recognize that taxing net is more complicated than taxing gross. But I think we're also all convinced, I think, and there's consensus around it, that there's always good economic reason to want to tax net. Second, I think anything that is new is complicated because it is new. Change can be unsettling. And if you've never read the existing rules, you also might find them complicated. Third, I think there's a difference between the complexity of getting your head around it, which is certainly significant, as opposed to operating it. And I think many of the points on amount A, like pillar two, are computational. So maybe also they can be simplified over time. And you can think about maybe as you move into the land of operating it, it is maybe easier in the long run than even the system as we have it. I think also um, there is a recognition that the complexity of the pillar falls on the broadest shoulders. That's the largest and most profitable businesses and the lead tax administration, typically the most sophisticated, where it is relatively speaking, relatively less burden on the, on the ones with lower capacity and in particular developing countries. And finally, as I guess I said before, complexity, I think, is also a sign in some sense that the process is working. If you just do the math, if you have 140 countries, you have 120 countries, take it, and they all have at least individually two issues, three issues that are really important for them. So you can hear those voices and you can bring those voices in the process and then they're heard and they're integrated. And if you just do the math, if everyone has those issues that are really dear to that country, you want to make them part of the solution. You want to integrate it at the price of, if you argue, complexity, but also that they find themselves in the solution. And so you end up with something seeking to address the differences, the uniqueness of all of those that come together in this broad inclusive framework. And then finally, I guess also before we get into the overview here, I guess it's also sometimes that if you have very simple solution, they may not actually be solutions. We could have not answered many of those questions, have had a short attack, but you wouldn't have had the answers. We wouldn't have been able to give you answers for the diverse circumstances that you are encountering. So that's my little promotional speech about, you know, sort of putting this into context and now taking you through a bit how this works. I guess this is the so-called amount A and conceptually as a piece of architecture, it's not complicated. We're essentially saying if you're very large, if you're very profitable, 20 billion, 10% profit margin, we're going to take 25% in excess of the 10% and we're going to allocate it on the basis of sales. That's a relatively straightforward concept that when you translate it into the reality, of course, has technical complexity, but it's also complexity so that when you then apply it, it actually works and you know what the answer is. So the first step in this is you determine the group revenue and the profitability text. 20 billion, 10% averaging, so you don't drop in and out constantly. So that's the first step. There's an exceptional segmentation rule. That means if there's a very large segment and on a standalone basis would be in scope, you're not out of scope because the average profitability of the larger firm of which you are a part is lower. And then finally, there's exclusions. There's exclusions for extractives, one of the important parts also for many of our developing country members, so that the economic rent from extractive stays in the country where it's dug out of the earth. But there's also others, regulated financial services, defense businesses, you know, engaging also with stakeholders. There's also a domestic business exemption for purely domestic business so that that revenue and that residual profit is not allocated around the world because it stays in that particular country. And in all of those features, there's a tax certainty process because we designed the process together with the rules. And so if you want to be knowing whether you're out of scope and you want to know that with binding effect in all the countries where this potentially applies and that will have signed up to the MLC, you will know and you will know it up front. 
And we try to make it easy working with stakeholders so that if you are likely to be out, then there are simplifications in the process of how you prove you're out, you get certainty you're out, and you know you're out, not in one country, but in all of those countries. That's the first step. If you're still in the process, then you continue on into the second step. And what happens in the second step? Here you need to apply the revenue sourcing rules and see where the money goes. What is your market jurisdictions? And we've worked a lot with several consultations to try to make these revenue sourcing rules work. We have allocation key to other features. And I think there again, we also have had particular um, interest in mind of some of the smaller jurisdictions, the low income jurisdictions, the lower middle income jurisdictions. So there's a tail end revenue. If you don't know because we're not forcing you to drill down to the last dollar, then some of that allocation, the tail end revenue, the so-called tail end revenue, uh, goes to some of the weaker members of the inclusive framework. A nexus test. A nexus test, and again, here specific consideration was being paid uh, to some of the developing countries. The nexus test, what is the threshold at which the taxing right sets in? And that again is lower for certain countries with a lower GDP than it is for others. So again, to reflect the particular circumstances of this diverse group of people that have come together, as Manel has said, in the inclusive framework. And once you know whether you're in scope and you know that you're in scope and you know what your market jurisdictions are and whether you have nexus at the end of step two, you get to step three. And what is that? You determine uh, the 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 allocation tax base. What is the profit that we're taking? We're starting with financial accounts because this is what companies have. We make some limited book to tax adjustments because we are using it as an allocation tax base. And there, of course, there are some complexities and it is a trade-off. There's on the one hand people that say, just take the financial accounts, but then everybody is unique and they all come in as well, more businesses as well as countries and say, we do need to make some adjustments because there is particular circumstances. And that's the trade-off that we have reached. And again, Thank you for all of those that participated in the consultation. And then we take 25% over 10 of this common tax base that we have determined and that we need because it's aspects of unitary taxation. And so then we take that and we allocate it. And then there is an important part that we adjust for double counting. And I pause here for a moment because that's an important point. That part of the architecture says if there's already residual profit in the market jurisdiction under the rules as they stand, we're not going to allocate, again, residual profit to that market jurisdiction. That market jurisdiction already taxes residual profit, so there's no need to adjust the system because in those particular circumstances, that problem pretending to solve does not arise. And so there is a mechanical way of doing this. I guess it's also something that allows us then to operate certainty around it, to make it easier to reduce disputes. And inside uh, this calculation, there's also withholding taxes. And there's, again, specific consideration taken for developing countries in the context of recognizing that the amount A may be reduced because taxation rights are already asserted on residual profit, computed using formulaic metrics as we do throughout uh, the pillar. And it also recognizes that the different stages of development, there's perhaps a higher propensity coupled with capacity to you rely on, on withholding taxes and that not all withholding taxes necessarily go to access profits. And that's uh, an important building block of which I think Jesse will take you a little more, but withholding taxes do come into the system with some appropriate adjustments that also take into account the stage of the development of the individual inclusive framework member. So that then tells you that you are in scope, that there is a uh, profit, how much that profit is and where that profit goes. But that importantly is not where we stop. We go on and then we say, this is a system that should not create double taxation. So once we've determined the so-called amount A, the rules for allocating it and where it goes and whether it should be reduced or offset or eliminated because there already is residual profit. So then we know that at the end of step three and we go to step four and that's where we eliminate double taxation. So we determine the relevant jurisdictional profit with a tiering system, having created a ratio that looks at which ones of your group operation are the most profitable expressed as a ratio of depreciation um, and payroll to accounting profit as adjusted in the tax base. We have a tiering system. We go to those jurisdictions and then we allocate um, the obligation to relief. There is some flexibility of jurisdictions, including working with the MLC to identify the individual relief entities in their jurisdiction. And then relief is provided where we've put in particular safeguards so that while there is some reliance on domestic positions, there's clear guardrails around it, ensuring that relief is actually provided. So we do not go into double taxation here. And finally, we've worked a lot also, as I said before, uh, to try to 
um, work on the administration on trying to make this simple, as simple as possible. So there's one filing with the lead tax administration, no separate filings in the countries where there is otherwise only amount A. There's a payment from a single group. There's a designated entity. It's typically the relationship. It's the parent. It can be somebody else, but it's typically the parent jurisdiction. There's a claim for double taxation relief. Again, that comes through compensating payments that are treated as a nothing. So a lot of work went on with stakeholders of trying to simplify and streamline the application of the administrative side for to include it in the MLC and then try to simplify it as much as possible. And as we said before, there is access to tax certainty. And that's important for two reasons, I guess. One is there is actually no audit. The amount A is a novel concept where collectively tax administration come together early. And if the MNE so desires, will give the MNE upfront certainty on where the money comes from, where the money goes, and how much it is. So there is no worries about the certainty with respect to the, uh, the taxing right that's being coordinated through this system amount A. But importantly also, and Jesse will talk about this a little more in a minute, there is also tax certainty um, with respect to related issues, typically transfer pricing, so that all the fundamental tax certainty issues that an in-scope m and &E faces will be addressed in a tax certainty process, either inside amount A, but then also with respect to transfer pricing, PE adjustments, other things in the existing system, because we do need to stabilize the existing system to be able to build amount A. And everybody recognizes that, which should drive us to better dispute resolution for those in scope. But not only that, I think we will also see a clear increase of early certainty being provided to in-scope MEs. So in some sense, there's a tax certainty shield being built here in the context of the groups in scope. Um, let me also say one word, I guess, as Manel had mentioned, there's still some ongoing work around some footnotes that we have seen. Um, and, and these, I think, are coming back to the 3-3, three, three, largely around the double counting. It's not a question of principle. There's constructive engagement with the small group on those issues. And it's more the scale of the recognition rather than the principle around withholding taxes. So we're, we're optimistic that, you know, sort of this is something that can be addressed. But just to give you a sense where they are, they're quite concentrated, a very small uh, number of jurisdictions with respect to very specific issues, which also shows you that when you look at the system as a whole, whether it's 95, 98, pick a number, but it's very, very stable with respect to practically all of those issues, even with respect to those that have some concerns, they're on a very specific issue. And then I have one more slide before I hand it over to Jesse. Um, and that's just running through on the next slide a bit. I think I was trying to mention this and weave it in as, as I spoke. There is a recognition that half of the members of the inclusive framework, if you think about it in one way, are developing countries. Now, we shouldn't overuse this term because in some sense, the discussion shows whether an amount B and amount A, every country is unique and we should be removing some of those labels. But still, I think there is a particular recognition, certainly for the lower income and that 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 you see that whether that's the extractive exclusions, I think that benefiting resource uh, rich countries in the developing world, making sure the economic rent stays there, it doesn't go to the market, whether it's tail end revenue and revenue sourcing, lower nexus rules for those for smaller economies with lower GDP, the minimum thresholds that essentially mean that while there will be no uh, lower or middle income countries that needs to relief because they're not even booking the residual profit in there. So no relief obligation, but at the same time, no reduction of the amount A because of the minimus. So there is a full payout um, here. There is, I think, also then finally on dispute resolution for some of our smaller uh, developing countries, I think it, dispute resolution becomes an elective discipline. They can use it and explore it, but they don't have to. So throughout every piece of the design, I think that clearly has been something that has been on the mind of the delegates in the rooms as they have gone through this. And then finally, as you can see, It's with the lead tax administration, we have special rules that make sure that there is representation by developing countries um, on the panel processes. But much of the burden, in some sense, sits with the lead tax administration with the large ME. So both from a substantive perspective and a process perspective, I think um, many representatives of some of the smaller countries um, have been very successful to engaging with their colleagues to come up with something that we hope is balanced, reflects both their economic interests and also their administrative capacity, while having full participation in all of the aspects of the development. With that, I hand it over to Jesse for more on the details. 
Thanks very much, Akim. Um, before diving into what's on slide 12 here, just to follow up a little bit on, on um, your mention of withholding taxes, um, you know, as Akim mentioned up front, when, when you're calculating the amount of profit that's allocated to market jurisdictions, there's an adjustment, uh, the marketing and distribution safe harbor adjustment that's meant to prevent uh, counting the same residual profit twice um, dur during um, the, the amount of process. Um, that MDSH calculation takes into account some cross-border withholding taxes um, because those are another way uh, that, that countries tax uh, income uh, domestically. Uh, and specifically, cross-border deductible payments made to in-scope M&Es are, are caught, meaning we don't, we don't cover withholding taxes on dividends, we don't cover withholding taxes on capital gains, we cover withholding taxes on cross-border deductible payments and only to in-scope uh, M&Es. And, and the general process is you use a formula to convert that, that withholding tax into a profit amount, which is used to increase the amount of, of that that MDSH adjustment, meaning it, it reduces the amount of profit. Um, it's not the entire converted profit amount uh, of that withholding tax that, that, that's applied to increase the MDSH, though it's a portion of it. Uh, you, you, you remove a portion that's meant to, to correspond to normal profit, so you're only focusing on, on, on a portion of the withholding tax that corresponds to, to, to a, a, a residual profit. Um, and, and, the reason I, I, I mentioned this is just because it went by very fast. I, I, I want to emphasize here that the amount of that portion of withholding tax that will be covered, that, that is sort of a key focus of the majority of the footnotes in, in, in the document. So, so it's not about whether we cover withholding taxes. It's, it's, uh, it, it's about the ways in which we adjust the amount of the withholding tax that are covered, that are, that are, that are um, the subject of, of those uh, footnotes. And that is the bulk of them. I, I, I raise it again only because um, I, it, it requires a little bit of reading to, through, 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 through the MLC to, to understand what those footnotes are, are, are referring to. Um, the withholding taxes also do ha have a secondary impact. They impact elimination as, as well, probably worth mentioning. Um, when a payment's received by a jurisdiction, they'll typically provide relief for, for double taxation. They effectively don't tax that profit. Um, uh, if you're then allocating a relief obligation out to countries based on the amount of, of, of profits earned in their jurisdiction, uh, it results in double counting if, if you treat them as having uh, had the profit that has been taxed elsewhere. So there's an adjustment uh, to, to the amount allocated to them for, for a purpose of determining how much they have to relieve in double taxation uh, to remove a portion of the withholding taxes that, 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 that are allocated to them. Um, and and that, that's just, just a slightly deeper look at, at, at where withholding taxes uh, feature in the MLC process since the question we've gotten a lot. Um, so uh, on this on slide twelve, you'll see we cover a couple of other aspects. Um, Akim went through much of the tax certainty process at a high level. I, I won't say a ton more about certainty with respect to amount A. It's intended to provide um, binding certainty over whether MEs are in scope. Um, and how they apply uh, the MLC. And that includes uh, an advanced certainty process to allow people to, to, to come in um, and, and, and effectively vet uh, the systems they're using to determine things like revenue sourcing, uh, among others, and make sure the systems they have in place are adequate uh, to the purpose of the MLC uh, and, and therefore get advanced approval to apply those systems for, for a fixed number of years without, uh, without being challenged unless something material changes. Um, they, they then have the ability to get um, certainty with respect to their full application of amount A, and, and that process um, starts uh, consultatively, but, but ultimately, if there are continued disputes, if the, if, if the tax authorities can't reach agreement, there is a binding determination process that will provide absolute certainty to taxpayers, including certainty with respect to, to, to the full elimination of, of double taxation. Um, with respect to related issues, you know, as Akim said, uh, amount A has to coexist with the existing tax rules, and that means that that disputes over how those existing rules apply can have an impact with respect to amount A. So when a jurisdiction makes an adjustment that relates to transfer pricing or, or, or business profits of a permanent establishment or, or, or the characterization of a payment that's subject to withholding tax, um, uh, uh, then you know where there's a treaty in place. Um, 
uh, the MLC can provide a couple of benefits, um, uh, assuming those adjustments actually have a material impact um, that, 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 uh, on the taxpayer uh, that might impact amount of relief or might, might otherwise be, be significant in amount. Um, and the MLC provides um, two, two key benefits. One is enhanced access to, to MAP and, and, and a full commitment to make sure that any, any agreement reached through the mutual agreement process is in fact uh, implemented. And, and second, uh, if, if disputes in that mutual agreement process go on for more than two years, then a panel gets formed uh, to resolve the dispute through, through a mandatory binding uh, resolution process, again, to ensure that, that in-scope m and have um, certainty, not just with respect to Amount A, but also with respect to, to, to uh, issues related to Amount A that may, that may have an impact that, that's relevant uh, to, to Amount A. Um, with respect to, to DSTs and relevant similar measures, um, a, a few things to say. You know, Mount A includes a commitment to remove and to stand still digital services taxes and relevant similar measures with respect to all companies uh, once the MLC comes into effect. That's not limited to the scope uh, of companies that are subject to Mount A, but, but all companies. Uh, any country that, that, that does in fact impose a digital service tax or relevant similar measure does lose Mount A in its entirety. Um, uh, until it until it removes that that tax, um, and the MLC includes a list of existing measures that that, that are going to be uh, removed. It, it also includes a definition of future measures that focus on a few a few criteria. Is it uh, a market based tax? Is it ring fenced to to uh, non residents or foreign owned businesses? And and is it outside the scope of tax treaties? And if it meets those criteria, uh, then it then it's uh, treated as a digital services tax and its imposition results in losing amount A. How do you determine that? Well, well the measures get evaluated by, by the conference of the parties, and there's a process designed to reach a resol resolution within 12 months. Um, there's also a, a provision that applies to significant economic presence type nexus rules and other novel nexus provisions. Uh, those rules are typically within the scope of tax treaties, meaning they don't meet the definition of, of a DST or, or relevant similar measures, but they do uh, overlap with amount A, so there's a need to make sure that they that they don't apply concurrently with amount A, and so there's a, a another provision in the MLC uh, that turns those measures off with respect to in scope M&E, so that it will be only amount A that applies. Um, so moving to the next slide. Um, a couple of things to talk about the, the MLC itself and, and, and how it fits together. The first is entry into force. Um, entry into force happens through a collaborative process. The countries decide together uh, when the MLC will enter into force. Uh, that process starts once 30 states that account for at least 60% of the ultimate parent entities of, of the ME groups that are expected to be in scope uh, have ratified. Uh, so once that threshold is met, then the countries decide when to bring it into force. And that's just to ensure that the MLC can actually function as it's intended to can, can achieve a meaningful reallocation of profits uh, and, 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 and uh, make sure that, that there are benefits there for everyone who's, who, who's joined. Um, how does the MLC interact with existing tax treaties? Well, uh, there are will continue to be existing bilateral treaties between parties to the MLC. They'll continue to apply as usual. They'll be superseded by the MLC only to the extent necessary to ensure that Amount A can apply. You know, Amount A is, it involves a novel nexus rule. Uh, it's not um, consistent with, the, with the, the traditional physical presence-based permanent establishment standards. There needs to be a rule to make sure it can apply despite the existence of those bilateral, bilateral treaties. So, so the MLC provides uh, that rule and it applies only with respect to to countries that actually join uh, the MLC. Um, there will be a lot of of uh, uh, decisions to be made over the course of time uh, under the MLC. Um, you know, countries will gain experience. We'll need to provide guidance about about how that works. There are a number of places in the MLC where, where, where uh, decisions may be required by the parties and, and, and the MLC establishes a conference of the parties to make those decisions or, or, or exercise those, those functions and, and, um, and, and do anything necessary to make sure the MLC can continue to run smoothly. Um, last sort of key structural point to mention about the MLC is, is the seven year review. Uh, the revenue threshold is set at 20 billion euros. It will be reduced to 10 billion euros after seven years uh, from, from its entry into force state. Um, 
uh, provided that unless the implementation is, is deemed not successful by the parties following review. So they review, uh, they identify any problems with implementation. Uh, if countries consider that it has not been implemented successfully, they raise objections with respect to those, those problems. They're then given two years to solve those specific problems. And, and uh, if they do that, the, the revenue threshold uh, drops. If, if they do not do that, um, then they have a choice to make whether to continue the MLC or, 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 or terminate the MLC. Uh, moving to the next slide, um, I won't go through the the the, the full layout of uh, uh, of the MLC here. So so maybe may worth just it's a useful reference to see how things are are, are laid out. See that the annexes match up nicely with with with, with the with the articles. Um, uh, the one thing I will say about this is uh, you know Akim talked a bit about complexity. Um, the MLC is, is a novel thing, right? We're setting out um, the details necessary to impose a, 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 a complete taxing right. And, and what is in the MLC is what countries felt was important to ensure that, that um, there are binding legal commitments among the countries about how the MLC will apply to make sure that there is a legal answer uh, to questions about whether countries are implementing this correctly and make sure that, that, that they are all implementing it in uniform ways, in the ways that really matter. Um, you'll see on the next slide, though, there, there is additional guidance to go along with that. We, we've included an explanatory statement, um, which, which is meant to clarify how uh, the MLC is intended to provide. It's meant it'll be agreed contemporaneously with the, with the conclusion of the final text of the MLC uh, to ensure that, that um, uh, it, it is considered context, which is an important sort of term of art for purposes of interpreting the, 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 the MLC under international law. It's meant to guide how the MLC is implied and includes a lot of useful stuff, a lot of examples, a lot of detail about how the provisions are intended to apply. Things that don't necessarily need to be reflected in the legal text of the MLC, but that was important to countries to reflect as an explanation of how the MLC will apply. Uh, you'll also see that, that one of the materials that was released was an understanding on the application of certainty for amount A. Um, this is a largely procedural document about how the certainty process will work. And that's another thing to, to point out about, about the overall complexity is that there is a lot of procedural stuff in the MLC in the explanatory statement and in, and in this US, UAC because the process matters to ensuring absolute certainty about how this all works. Um, uh, and, and so that, that, that's just, I guess, a long way of, of saying um, that, that these materials are, are, are there to help understand the MLC. The overall package, you, you need to think of it in terms of establishing a, a, a new system of, uh, of taxing the profits that are subject to, to amount A. Um, some amount of co complexity is unavoidable, um, but the point of so much of that complexity is to ensure that there is a legal binding agreement among countries about how the system will work in detail and to minimize the, 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 the chance of, of different interpretations among countries about how it will all work. Um, and with that, I will turn it over to Jessica to, to talk about uh, the STTR. Thank you very much, Jesse, and good morning, everybody. Now turning to pillar two, and we will start with the subject to tax rule, a treaty-based rule that is also known as the STTR. And on the STTR, we're happy to inform you that since we've last spoke in July and since we've release the STTR model treaty provision, the inclusive framework has formally adopted the text of a multilateral instrument that will facilitate the implementation of the STTR in existing bilateral tax treaties. The text, the English and French text of the explanatory statement of the instrument and the instrument it ex itself, of course, was adopted on the 15th of sep September, and it is now open for signature. At the moment, the Secretariat is working with interested jurisdiction towards their signature, and we are also developing various tools that will assist countries and stakeholders in the application and implementation of the instrument. That's for the multilateral instrument that we will refer to as the STTR MLI. What's also important to note is that we are currently, when we think about implementation, we're carrying out work uh, on a process associated with a process that will assist country 
in implementing the STTR. That process was developed by the inclusive framework as well, and it is currently ongoing. Uh, the, the main objective of the process is to provide support to country. Here, it's not a pro it's not a peer review process. It's really a process that is also closely related to the commitment on the STTR, because you will remember that there was a commitment made on the STTR, a commitment that can be found in the 2021 October statement. And in short, that commitment is that inclusive framework members that apply nominal rates uh, below the STTR minimum rate of 9% to item of covered income have committed to introduce the STTR in their bilateral tax treaties if they are requested to do so by inclusive framework members that are considered as developing countries for the purposes of the STTR. With pr that process, what we will do is to we will provide support to developing countries that would consider making requests, and this uh, will we, that support will be provided through dedicated support, but also through information that we will be pro providing um, that we will provide to those countries. That information will include list of existing treaties that could be the object of a request. And we will also provide information on each of those tax treaties to inform how the STTR would apply in those treaties if it would be implemented. We can move to the next slide, please. Now, just a quick overview uh, on this new multilateral instrument that will facilitate the implementation of the SCTR in existing bilateral tax treaties. The first thing to note is that that new instrument resembles in some ways the BEPS multilateral instrument that was used to introduce the BEPS treaty related measures in existing treaties. So it is here an instrument that will change existing tax treaties to introduce the SCTR. It's not a new instrument that will come and create new treaty relationship between countries. It's only an instrument that will come and introduce the STTR where relevant in existing tax treaties. It's also a, an instrument that could it, that could update the treaty network of countries all at once. This means that with one signature and one ratification, a country could update all of its relevant tax treaty at once, just like the BEPS multilateral instrument. Uh, the thing to note, however, is that this new instrument is different when compared to the BEPS multilateral instrument in various ways. For instance, it is an instrument that is, unlike the BEPS MLI, it's an instrument that is not flexible. For instance, it's an instrument that does not contain any reservation. That means that when the instrument would apply to a given treaty, in all cases, that the STTR will be implemented in full in that treaties without any possibility, in, in, without any, any flexibility. It's also important to note that the instrument will not come and change the existing text of a treaty or the existing provision. When the instrument will apply to a tax treaty, what it will do de facto is that it will add in that treaty annexes, and in it, it's in those annexes that you will find the STTR and other accompanying provision. I will stop here, but if you have any questions on the STTR or the MLI, don't hesitate to contact the team. And I will now hand over to Yasna, who will talk about GLOBE and Pilsu. Thank you, Jessica. So Jessica, to you very clearly to the STTR, which is the first element of Pillar 2, and I'm going to give you an update on the Pillar to the global minimum tax uh, and the updates that we have seen in the past months. Um, so just to recall, uh, the model rules, the global model rules, were developed by tax experts from over 140 countries. And as such, they're necessarily quite detailed to give the maximum clarity and tax certainty. And Ahim was already explaining this in Jesse as well in the pillar one context, right? That we are dealing with countries and their tax systems and each of the tax system has its own unique features and two or three or more particularities. And then at the same time, we also have the industry. We have different sectors that also have different needs. So taking all of this together, we see that we have, you know, on both sides, uh, different circumstances and particular issues that we need to address 
uh, and account for. And as such, of course, you know, the context that we operate in um, can lead to a set of rules that is comprehensive, uh, not maybe necessarily simple at the first sight, uh, but also, as Ahim said, uh, if it's simple, it might not give you uh, the right solution. And similar can also be, you know, maybe set for the pillar two. Uh, and this is where the handbook comes in. Um, so I mentioned the context and, you know, the waters that we navigate in and the handbook uh, was designed as a tool to help the tax policy officers navigate those waters and to give them a high level entry point in the overall design of the rules of the global minimum tax and also the considerations to be taken in assessing the implementation options. Um, so the rules, um, as I said, are very comprehensive. They address particular situations because those situations are the ones that uh, we have to deal with. Uh, but the handbook, uh, on the other hand, is not designed as a technical guide through all those rules, but rather is designed as an accessible way uh, to the rules and to really leave the reader uh, with an understanding of the overall concept and the design. Um, so, and the, on the other hand, the outlining the considerations that need to be taken into the account of the implementation process also give uh, the tax policy officers and administration of officials uh, sort of a tool that they can use in consultation with the stakeholders. So in through the different stages of the implementation process, um, sort of a, uh, let's say an assistance in going through that process smoothly. Um, so that's just a bit the, the concept of the implementation handbook. And if we dive into a bit of the structure uh, into the next slide, uh, you will see how the handbook achieves that in 29 pages. Uh, so in the first chapter, um, I mentioned, right, we have, uh, well, you know yourself that the globe model rules are divided in 10 chapters, uh, but in chapter one of the handbook, uh, we focus on the core provisions. So these core provisions really give a sense and the design of the rules. They entail the core elements and they're also drafted in a user-friendly uh, manner. Um, so normally, uh, number seven is the fairy tale number, uh, but for the sake of simplicity, we decided to scale down to six. So we present you a six step analysis, uh, and that includes, you know, determining whether the M&E group is in scope, uh, then uh, determining the income of each constituent entity of that m and group, depending on its location, uh, then this income is used to calculate the globe income by doing certain adjustments uh, to that income. Uh, we also, of course, include the step of determination of the adjusted cover taxes, because those are the two elements that then need to be used in the computation of the ETR. And this computation of the ETR, provided that it's below uh, 15%, basically uh, triggers the fact that the top up tax needs to be applied. Uh, but very importantly, in the top up tax element, we also have what we refer to as substance based income exclusion, uh, which uh, kind of gives space for the, the let's say, the efficient uh, tax incentives. And then this leads you to the percentage of the top up tax. And then the top up tax is charged according to the agreed rule order, either under the QDMPT, IR, or the UTPR. So those are the basic six steps. Of course, the handbook gives a bit uh, more details onto those, also leads the reader to the right uh, re reference where you can find more details, uh, but it's really designed as a way to give you sort of a, um, a core provisions in a nutshell. And then, you know, moving to the chapter two of the handbook, um, here we see, if you, we can just um, click, please. Thank you so much. Uh, so here we see that we divided a bit the implementation consideration into two steps of the analysis that the, uh, the tax officials can take. So when, as a first step, uh, what is really important is to assess the impact that the rules might have in the jurisdiction. Um, and that doesn't necessarily mean that you need to arrive to certain, like explicit numbers, uh, but it's really to understand the m &E groups in scope to understand your own uh, sort of context um, and also to see how the domestic operations are impacted and how the foreign uh, operations are impacted. 
Um, and then we have also different reform options that we list out in the handbook. And these are again, um, you know, they vary from more, let's say, particular options that jurisdictions could adopt or more targeted actions, such as, for example, the QDMTT. Um, then we also have options you know, that related to the tax base, that related to the income inclusion rule, to the UTPR. So this is all kind of lays out the different, uh, different avenues that um, are possible in the context of implementing the global minimum tax. And importantly, what we would like to highlight is also that uh, the consultation with the stakeholders is, of course, important. And this is really the tool that could help the both sides um, and kind of lead both of the sides to see what is the best uh, decision to take in that context. Then we also have, of course, the final step, which is implementing the rules. Uh, the handbook lays out the different legislative techniques, and we also saw already some jurisdictions taking different techniques. For example, uh, New Zealand has implemented the rules by reference. This is the legislative technique that um, we refer to. Uh, so it's quite, let's say, straightforward. It's a, uh, of course, it also depends on the legislative framework the jurisdiction operates within, whether this uh, framework permits such an implementation. And then we also have jurisdictions uh, such as, for example, uh, Germany or the UK, where they in, uh, use a legislative technique, which is direct. So it's an incorporation of the entire text of the global monetary rules. Um, then we also see in jurisdictions that have already are quite advanced with implementation, uh, that what is um, very important is the using both primary and secondary legislation uh, way of implementing the rules in their domestic system. And another important aspect is ensuring the consistency. Um, so you are probably familiar with the term qualified rules. Uh, so when implementing the rules, uh, this is really important to kind of keep in mind uh, that the outcome that the global model rules um, should lead to and the implementation of, of them in the domestic uh, system is such that it should ensure the same outcomes. And of course, that's in such a way we can also ensure consistency in the application of the rules among all the implementing um, jurisdictions. Um, so we have um, presented this in the handbook. Um, this is a bit of a teaser, let's say. Uh, of course, I don't want to give you all the details uh, for that. I would invite you to read the handbook. Um, but it's really something that, of course, it's a um, it's a tool that will keep on being used. It's not just a book that you read and you put on a shelf, but should really um, also assist different uh, stakeholders uh, involved in the implementation process. So if we move now to the next slide, um, I would like to give you an update on the implementation. And here where we need to kind of pause is a bit, you know, where we are really uh, in the process, uh, where we, what do we see among jurisdictions, of course, we see certain things in the media, we see certain things um, at conferences, at events. You know, we, of course, work together with the jurisdictions as the OECD secretariat. We have the inclusive framework uh, where jurisdictions talk among each other. Um, and based on this information, we see that uh, jurisdictions are at different stages, right? So, of course, also jurisdictions have different legislative processes. So naturally, they are at different stages. Uh, and we see that there are several jurisdictions with already enacted legislation, such as Korea, uh, Japan, or the United Kingdom, for example. Um, there are also many jurisdictions that have draft legislation published. So the draft is already out there for consultation, but not yet enacted. Uh, so these countries are, for example, Canada, Vietnam, uh, New Zealand. And in this kind of category, we, can, we should also keep in mind the 27 EU member states for which the directive has already been adopted. Uh, but of course, the directive requires transposition into domestic law, and some of them already have that draft legislation publicly available, and some are still in the stages of preparing it. Um, then we also have approximately 10 jurisdictions that have, have publicly stated the intent to implement. Uh, for example, Australia, Malaysia, Singapore, Thailand, and uh, many others. Um, and then there are also more than 10 jurisdictions that have uh, also publicly stated that they are considering the implementation. Uh, for example, Bermuda, Mauritius, United Arab Emirates, uh, um, and there are a few other countries um, that we have in mind. 
Um, and beyond that, we as the OECD Secretariat, we are also working with jurisdictions that have not yet made any public announcements, but are also considering adopting the rules. And at the same time, we also have an ongoing work to support the implementation and application of the rules. Uh, so this is the work that's ongoing at the inclusive framework level. And we are working on addressing several specific issues in the form of administrative guidance to provide clarifications where needed on issues like flagged by the business or the jurisdictions themselves. Uh, for example, we have a specific application of the rules uh, to particular circumstances to address the timing differences between the local tax and the accounting rules. For example, the, it's a technical term on the deferred tax liability recapture. Uh, but then we also have issues related to the application of the CBC safe harbor and for the filing of filing relief for short years for the 2026 globe information return. And then we also have much more specific ones like industry specific ones. For example, we are working on the substance based income exclusion for ships and planes. Um, at the same time, we have the peer review process ongoing. So I mentioned uh, that uh, the rules can be giving a status of qualified rules and then of course that has specific uh, effect to the application of the rules that you can read about in the handbook. Um, and we are now at the stages of developing the peer review process and this process um, will, as said, give the rules the qualified uh, status and also give effect to the rule order and the coordination of the application of the rules. Um, now, not last but not least, um, we are also focusing on administrative framework. Uh, so those there are two streams of work still ongoing there. We have the exchange of information in the context of which the XML schema is being prepared, which is the underlying base for exchanging the information received from uh, the globe information return as reported uh, by the MEs in scope. And then we also have the tax certainty uh, work stream. So the tax certainty is, of course, as important as in Pillar 1, also in Pillar 2. That's also very important administrative support system and framework um, that one needs to really ensure that the compliance is eased for the business, but at the same time that the consistent application uh, is ensured throughout all the implementing jurisdictions. I stop here um, and I give, uh, I'll give the floor over to David, who will guide you through the impact assessment on the pillars. Thank you. Well, thanks very much, Yasna, and it's great to be able to join you today and to share with you some insights from the work that we have been carrying out on the economic impact assessment. Uh, now, today, um, if we can move to the next slide, I'll be focusing in particular on amount A of Pillar 1, uh, but I will also have one slide on Pillar 2, and I see that there was a question that has come in about uh, future impact assessment uh, work on Pillar 2. I'll, I'll address that shortly. In terms of uh, amount A of Pillar 1, to coincide with the release of the multilateral convention, we also released a, a working paper that presents an update of the impact assessment on amount A. And some of the key findings uh, arising from that work are that firstly, it demonstrates that amount A uh, brings about a reallocation of taxing rights, principally from investment hubs to market jurisdictions. I say principally because we see that around 70% of all of the surrendered taxing rights uh, come from investment hubs. And of course, the, the objective of amount A is to deliver taxing rights to market jurisdictions. Now, in terms of that reallocation of taxing rights, we see that even though it's, uh, it's zero sum in terms of the amount of tax base that exists, we do see amount A raising revenue globally. And that is because of this reallocation from what are typically lower tax jurisdictions uh, to uh, relatively higher tax jurisdictions. And we see that in 2021, using the data from that year, that the global gains per year uh, would be in the order of 17 to 32 billion US dollars. Now we find uh, on average that revenue gains accrue to all jurisdictions, except for investment hubs, with higher gains experienced uh, by smaller and lower income countries. And that's of course, is a, a share of of current corporate income tax revenues. Now, of course, uh, with any analysis, there are always a range of caveats. Uh, I direct you to uh, the, those caveats in detail in the paper itself, but uh, it is uh, worth acknowledging that both from a modeling perspective and in terms of the availability of data, 
these estimates are always subject to caveats. We have a link on this page that uh, will direct you to that working paper and for those interested, I encourage you to read it. If we can move to the next slide, uh, on the next slide, uh, we focus in on uh, the allocable residual profit that is in scope of amount A. And this chart here shows a couple of things. Firstly, it shows uh, the extent of that uh, residual profit uh, that will be allocable. And we see that it is growing over time uh, with uh, in 2021, uh, it reaching around 200 billion US dollars of profit in scope. The other dimension uh, that this graph shows is it shows the, uh, the composition in terms of the sectors or the industries uh, that will be contributing towards uh, that amount A. And uh, if you uh, add up, for example, the, the bottom four categories, uh, which uh, can collectively be seen uh, as a proxy for digital businesses, if you like, uh, we see that they account for around 53% of total residual profit in 2021. Now, if we can move to the next slide, uh, on the next slide, we see uh, the point that I made a little earlier, and that is that we see uh, revenue gains on average across all jurisdiction groups except for investment hubs. So we see here, uh, and in particular, uh, that rising profile so that in 2021 we see higher gains for high income, middle income, and in particular, low income countries. Uh, and then, of course, you see uh, the impact on investment hubs, which tend to lose tax base and also to a lesser extent tax revenues. Uh, but uh, this just uh, shows uh, across the, the profile of those jurisdiction groups what we anticipate will be the revenue impacts. Moving to the next slide, and this slide uh, I think is important in highlighting some of the issues that we heard about a little earlier. Markim in particular mentioned some of the, the design features that uh, are of particular benefit to developing countries and lower and middle income jurisdictions uh, more broadly. And what this chart shows is a series of specific design decisions and design elements and the impact that they have for this cohort, this group of countries. Uh, and we effectively see that those design features, and we spell them out there, uh, whether it be de minimis provisions in relation to both uh, the elimination of double taxation as well as the MDSH, whether it be the, the tail end revenues uh, or uh, the, the macro keys in revenue sourcing, or it be the, the lower nexus threshold. All of these design elements agreed, many of them hard fought uh, by uh, many developing countries in the course of the negotiations. They have the combined effect of approximately doubling the tax base increased uh, for low and middle income jurisdictions. And that's compared to what would have been the case if these provisions had not been included. So this I think is, is a really uh, good indication of the way in which uh, having uh, an inclusive group of countries at the table has ensured an outcome uh, that has uh, seen improvements for uh, developing countries. If we can move to the next slide, and this will be my final slide and my only slide on, on pillar two. Uh, and uh, just to respond to the question that we received on the chat, uh, we will be carrying it, we are carrying out more impact assessment work on pillar two, and we hope to release uh, more detailed impact assessment work for, for the global minimum tax before the end of the year. So stay tuned for that. But as a, a preview or just a, a teaser for that up upcoming release, uh, I want to just highlight a couple of points from the work that we've been doing in drilling down on this question of the location of low tax profit. You, you, would, have, you would have heard me many times before uh, on these webinars talk about what we describe as pockets of low tax profit in high tax jurisdictions. Well, this slide shows a, a couple of important points. Firstly, it shows that uh, we expect that pillar two, uh, after it comes into effect, will reduce global low tax profit by about 70%. And we define low tax profit here as being profit that is subject to an ETR of less than 15%. But I think what is also really important here is that we observe substantial levels of low tax profit across all jurisdiction groups. So looking at this graph, graph and looking at the, the left-hand bar, left-hand column, we see that around 30% of profit in all jurisdictions so low income, middle income, and high income jurisdictions 
is currently subject to an effective tax rate below 15%. And of course, that profit would be affected or subject to the global minimum tax. We see this figure being higher for investment hubs at 70%. Uh, but this graph also shows the Im impact of the global minimum tax, also taking into account the substance-based income exclusion and how that reduces uh, the amount of that low tax profit. But I guess all of this is to highlight the simple fact that all jurisdictions we observe have substantial pockets of low tax profit. And that means that the global minimum tax is, is of critical importance to all jurisdictions, uh, including developing countries, uh, even countries that have higher statutory tax rates. Uh, and this, I think, really does highlight the importance of putting in place uh, a, a domestic minimum top-up tax, uh, and in particular, by putting in place a, a QDMTT, uh, that will ensure not only that the source jurisdiction is able to collect that additional tax that is going to be collected somewhere, but will be able to do that in a way that does not have any adverse impact on its competitiveness uh, when it comes to attracting foreign direct investment. So we think that uh, these are really important findings that we hope will inform countries as they think about uh, these important questions of implementation of uh, the global minimum tax and uh, are guided by some of the, uh, the recommendations and the guidance that Yasna has just spoken about. Uh, I'll leave it there, um, but please uh, keep your eyes peeled for uh, the forthcoming release of further material on the global minimum tax. But now I'll hand over to Heike, who will be talking about the support that is being provided to developing countries. Thank you very much, David, and hello, everyone. Yeah, David and, and Achim have already um, pointed out uh, the impact that the two pillars will have on developing countries in which uh, features uh, have been included into uh, the two pillars uh, to take uh, account of the of the specific circumstances uh, of developing countries. So I will move directly to the next slide, please. Capacity building is central uh, to our work. And we have set up a, a comprehensive uh, package uh, of um, outreach activities, uh, training material, and targeted uh, bilateral support. And a first lesson learned from uh, this capacity building is uh, that uh, most for most of countries, it's really important to hold, to have a whole of government approach in coordination with uh, development partners. This is a uh, uh, especially critical for the review of tax incentives, which are often governed um, by other agencies um, than ministries of finance, um, such as uh, trade and investment uh, bodies, in which what works uh, very well uh, currently on the, on the globe rules are um, successful drafting workshops um, that we are carrying out uh, with jurisdictions uh, that are at similar stages uh, in the drafting and implementation process um, of the of the globe rules. Currently, we are um, developing a comprehensive implementation plan, as uh, was asked uh, in the July statement. Um, so this will help countries uh, to analyze uh, the impact of the rules, to implement the rules in law, and to apply them in practice. So key for us uh, is the coordination of this relevant regional and international organizations. And we will also invite uh, all stakeholders uh, to a dialogue uh, on implementation of the two pillar solution. This could uh, have the form of an inclusive framework implementation stakeholders forum. Thank you very much. And I hand over to Manal. Great, thank you, Heike, and uh, thank you to all the speakers. Um, we'll just uh, do very, very quick wrap up in, in recognition that we are over time. Um, if we just go to the next slide, there are certainly a number of publications um, and events. I know this is uh, coming up, but I did want to say one of the things that we will continue to do is, is keep an eye on um, getting stakeholder input on various priorities. We did hold a, a recently a uh, global mobility stakeholder event. We'll talk about that um, and give you more of a readout at a later time. If we just go to the final um, slide, the uh, th this slide lists some of the upcoming publications and events. And then of course, 
we will continue to do work on completing um, the, both the pillar one and, and pillar two work. Um, with respect to the MLC, I will. Um, I recognize there continues to be an appetite and a number of questions that have remained open on technical aspects. And so um, in, in the interest of uh, being responsive to that, we will hold a, another technical webinar that is focused on the specific architecture and, and its operation of the MLC in the last full week of October, likely on the 26th, 27th of October. Um, so tune in for that and we'll let you know specifically. Um, so again, apologies for running over um, and uh, thank you for joining us and we'll continue to try to respond to the topics that you're most interested in hearing from us on. Thanks all, thanks again to the team for their work today and um, have a pleasant rest of your day to everyone. Thank you.